right, we're starting a new chapter. It's uh, on microbial growth. Our learning objectives for this first section are to identify the major physical requirements for microbial growth and classify organisms based on those requirements as well as the chemical requirements for growth. Also, we're getting back. We talked about biofilms a little bit in chapter one, both the beneficial and harmful effects of biofilms. So when we talk about microbial growth, just like we talk about in our own cells, we're not talking about um, the size of the cell. We're talking about the number of cells. So the reason you're bigger now than when you were a baby is you have more cells, not because they got bigger. Well, we can look at it the same way when we look at microbial growth. We're not talking about cell size, but the number of cells. So we're looking at the populations and the number of colonies. So we can break down the requirements for growth into two categories, physical requirements and chemical requirements. Physical requirements include three main things. Does it have an optimal temperature, pH, and osmotic pressure? And this is really dealing with um, salt conditions or um, solute levels, okay? Chemical requirements include some of the major chemicals such as carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, trace elements, of course oxygen, and then any other kind of organic growth factors. So we'll be talking about each of those. So we'll start first with the physical requirements. Um, all organisms for temperature have a minimum growth temperature, that temperature that is the lowest point at which they could still grow a maximum growth temperature, and then an optimum growth temperature. That's the temp they grow best at. And when your microbes um, came shipped from the biological supply company on the actual vial, it had a certain temperature on it, and that temperature is the optimal growth temperature. That's why some of you always store your microbes in the 30 degrees Celsius incubator, some of you in the 25 degrees Celsius incubator, and others in the 37 degrees Celsius incubator, because that's the optimum growth temperature for your particular microbe. Now we can divide uh, microbes into um, different temperature groups based on what they, where they can kind of grow best at. And one of them is called the psychrophiles. Now, file always means loving. The psychrophiles are cold loving. So they like temps between zero and 15 degrees Celsius. So this would be like things, um, freezer temps and fridge temps. Okay. So um, psychrophiles, cold loving, which kind of makes sense because, you know, we live up here in uh, what we sometimes like to call the frozen tundra. So I think we're kind of psychro for liking to live here. Get it? Psychrophile. Okay, anyway, corny joke for the day. Um, psychrotrophs, they like to grow between 0 and 20 to 30 degrees Celsius, so a little bit warmer. So this might be a little bit more fridge temperature versus freezer. These are the ones that are gonna cause most food spoilage because it's a little bit closer to fridge temperature or even maybe a little bit warmer where they can kind of really grow the best. So you don't wanna uh, you know, keep that food sitting out too long. 25 degrees Celsius is kind of like room temperature and they grow really well there but they can also be in that cooler temperature that would be like in your fridge as well. The mesophiles are the moderate, meso, moderate temperature loving microbes. And so between 25 and 40 degrees Celsius. And most microbes actually fall into this category. Can you think why? Well, around 37 degrees Celsius is body temperature for humans okay so when you think about all those microbes that live in and on you they like that temperature 
and so they like to live in your body where it is that temperature. So even things that infect you, harmful bacteria that are pathogenic, they thrive in your body temperature. So um, all of those are mesophiles. So most of the microbes that we think of when we talk about bacteria are going to be a mesophile. Thermophiles are heat loving. They like it a little bit warmer, 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. And then hyper means more than. So a hyperthermophile loves extreme heat, so 80 degrees Celsius or higher. This would be like in the um, hot springs, uh, volcanic vents, things like that. Think of uh, like uh, at Yellowstone, Old Faithful, that volcanic, volcanic vent, that, those hot springs in those area. Bacteria that love to live around there would be the hypothermal, hyperthermophiles. So you can see here as we um, go increase our temperature and the rate of growth where some of these psychrophiles and psychotrophs, mesophiles, thermophiles, and hyperphiles, hypo, hyperthermophiles would fall where they'd have their best rate of growth at some of those various temperatures. This also kind of shows you food preservation temperatures. Um, right in here, zero to five or four degrees, that's, that's refrigerator temperature right here. And so they allow slow growth. That's why if you keep things in your fridge, even though it's cooler there, they, microbes can still grow. It's just at a very much slower rate. So your milk is still gonna spoil if it sits in your fridge for too long fungus is still going to grow and molds it will still form on your food if you just let it sit there for too long so but when you get below freezing you're not going to have a lot of growth here's the danger zone right in here anywhere between 15 to 50 degrees um, celsius there lots of rapid growth okay and some of those that produce toxins that can actually cause you know kind of more of that severe food poisoning um, that's where we have to really worry about. And then when you get really high temperatures, that's going to destroy most microbes as well. Um, most microbes like a particular pH as well. Most of them like kind of right around that neutral area, anywhere between 6.5 to 7.5 for a pH level. Um, molds and yeast tend to be a little slightly more acidic in liking more between pHs between 5 and 6. If something is an acidophile, it likes, loves, I should say, even acidic environments. So they're going to grow a little bit more acidic area. So there's a bacterium, Helobacter, uh, Helobacter pylori. I don't know if I have that one correct or not. Those are the ones that can cause stomach ulcers. So obviously they can withstand really acidic conditions because your stomach is very acidic. Osmotic pressure, anytime you have hypertonic environments. So I mainly talked about salt earlier, but it could be sugar as well. Anytime you have a highly hypertonic environment, remember that can cause plasmolysis. Water will leave the cell by osmosis and the cytoplasm will actually shrink. That's the plasmolysis. Oh, excuse me. But there are some of what we call as extreme or obligate halophiles that require high osmotic pressure. These are the salt-loving bacteria. Halophiles. So they, they really like that. Facultative halophiles can tolerate it. Okay. Whereas the obligate ones require it. They need to be in a high salt concentration. So you might find some of these living in areas like the, the De um, Great Salt Lake, Dead Sea. Some of these that have uh, maybe the ocean that have really salty conditions. Um, a lot of times foods such as um, salted fish and honey are protected from microbes due to their high salt and sugar content. And, it, and that's one of the methods that um, is often used to preserve food and prevent spoilage by microbes is to either have it highly salted or have it packed in sugar so that, or honey, or something that's really um, 
very hypertonic so that the microbes can't survive that. Again, we went through this when we went through cell transport. Some of the chemical requirements, carbon, of course, um, all organic materials are made of carbon and um, uh, it's used in structural organic molecules as an energy source. Uh, chemoheterotrophs need to use organic carbon. And of course, autotrophs um, need to use CO2 as their form of carbon as they carry on photosynthesis. Nitrogen is needed for amino acids and proteins. All organisms are made up of proteins and need to be able to make proteins. Therefore, nitrogen is a very important source. Well, bacteria are ma major decomposers of proteins, but they are the main organisms that help in cycling of nitrogen. At every single step of the nitrogen cycle, there's different bacteria playing a role. Um, some of them use ammonium or nitrates. Um, some bacteria use atmospheric nitrogen gas and, and use a process called nitrogen fixation to convert nitrogen gas to a usable form that that plants can can then utilize and then as animals eat plants then they get the nitrogen source that they need so the the only way we get our nitrogen source is by eating either plants or animals and, and eating their protein we break it down into amino acids and then we reassemble that into proteins in our body um, sulfur also found in uh, amino acids thymine and biotin and um, most bacteria help decompose proteins and uh, obtain the sulfur that way. Phosphorus, again, um, is found in DNA. Um, sugar phosphate backbone that makes up DNA and RNA. Adenosine triphosphate, ATP, has phosphorus in it, as well as your phospholipid membranes that make up your cell membrane and the membranes in mitochondria and chloroplasts. Right? And then there's also trace elements that organisms need, inorganic elements required in very small amounts. A lot of these sometimes can act as your enzyme cofactors. Oxygen, <laughs> based on whether or not or how much organisms can utilize oxygen, um, we, we kind of break down organisms into different groups. If an organism requires oxygen to live, they are obligate aerobes. They're obligated to have that air, that oxygen. If they are a facultative anaerobe, they use oxygen when it's available, so they'd, they'd much prefer that, but if it's not, they can survive without it. So that means they can switch and use fermentation or anaerobic respiration. E. coli is an example. An obligate anaerobe is unable to use oxygen and is actually harmed by it. So um, Clostridium genus, so Clostridium tetanus and Clostridium botulinum, both of those are obligate anaerobes. That's why when they always talk about, oh, if you step on a nail, you, you better get your tetanus shot, you're going to get tetanus. Well you're not necessarily going to get tetanus unless that Clostridium tetani bacteria is on that nail. But the reason they talk about that is the puncture of the nail up into your foot, if there were some Clostridium tetani bacteria on there, by being pushed all the way into your tissues, it's now away from the surface of your foot, so there's not as much oxygen there. That means that that bacteria could thrive in the deeper tissues of your foot where there's not as much oxygen because they are obligate anaerobes. They can't use oxygen. So that's why anytime they say you have a deep cut or scrape or things like that, you know, make sure your tetanus shot is up to date because you don't want those bacteria to get deep within some of your tissues where there's not as much oxygen. Um, aerotolerant anaerobes cannot use oxygen for growth, but they can tolerate it. And then microaerophiles, they require oxygen, but at lower concentrations that are in the surrounding air. So how does that look if you were to grow them in a uh, growth medium? If you're an obligate aerobe, 
you'll see them kind of concentrated near the top where there's still some oxygen here. Facultative anaerobes, well, they'll, they'll utilize oxygen if it's available, but they can still grow here where it's not. Obligate anaerobes don't want anything to do with where the oxygen is, so they're going to settle more at the bottom. Aerotolerant anaerobes, uh, they kind of grow evenly throughout because oxygen doesn't really even have an effect on them. And then microaerophiles, they're going to have kind of almost their own little band in here where they're going to grow because they only grow where their low concentration of oxygen has diffused into the medium. So they're going to kind of concentrate there. So each of them gives a very distinct pattern. And so we're going to be having you use a particular growth medium and, and check to see where does your microbe like to grow best. Um, some oxygen is toxic to organisms. And um, depending on whether it's an obligate aerobe or an obligate anaerobe, um, some of these different forms of oxygen may be toxic to different things. So if it's in the form of hydrogen peroxide, for example, that can um, cause some issues. Organic growth factors. Um, these are essential organic compounds uh, an organism is unable to make on its own, and so they have to be obtained from the environment. So things like vitamins, amino acids, uh, the purines and pr pyrimidine bases that are part of, um, make up part of the DNA, um, all of those are, can be organic growth factors. And then finally, um, biofilms. Biofilms are microbial communities, so it's not usually just one microbe, but it's several different microbes kind of living together kind of in conjunction with each other, and then they can form these slime or hydrogels. And um, they can be found uh, little kind of sticky surfaces that you might skim off that might be on rocks, teeth, your mucous membranes, on the sides of your uh, aquarium if you have one of those. But they can actually um, kind of help each other out by living together. They can share nutrients and space. They can maybe by living together in a group, they can shelter each other from harmful factors such as maybe um, antimicrobial chemicals or antibiotics or things like that by growing together. They can maybe ward that off. And they can also help out in sewage treatment facilities with a breakdown of waste. How can they be uh, harmful? A lot of them, once they form a biofilm, uh, are more resistant to some of your antimicrobial agents, your chemical agents, and so on. Uh, most of them are involved in causing bacterial infections. In, in fact, nosocomial infections um, in catheters, which a lot of times will cause UTIs, uh, uterine tract infections. They can form on a lot of uh, indwelling medical devices inside an individual, but a lot of them are uh, found on catheters, one of those main causes of uh, urinary tract infections. And that's it for this section.